it's a great honor for me uh, uh, to open uh, this journey, Gretchen and Barry Mazur. Uh, I should say that after breakup of Soviet Union, I uh, spent several years in Boston and was lucky to talk to Barry uh, about uh, some piece of mathematics I was interested in at that time. And uh, Barry is a universal mathematician. So uh, he blends geometry and arithmetic and algebra in a kind of unique artistic way. And I very much admire how Barry uh, uh, does mathematics, how he thinks about mathematics, but also how he writes mathematics and uh, how he speaks uh, about mathematics. Uh, when I was in Cambridge, I even uh, went sometimes to the low-grade courses where I knew the subject, but I just wanted to see how Barry uh, speaks about the subject. Uh, but more than that, for me, Barry is a, a man of Renaissance, uh, so it's not only mathematics, uh, it's uh, all many other human intellectual activities. Uh, so so it's, it's hard to name all of them, uh, philosophy, poetry, and I just uh, was lucky once to be at a Kajdan Mazur seminar on philosophy. And this was actually was an unfor unforgettable impression for me. So Barry spoke about Kant. And uh, I never thought uh, that it could be so interesting. So I'm from former Soviet Union, so I had some kind of attitude to philosophy. And this dramatically changed my, my attitude to that. So it was just one Barry's lecture on the subject. Okay, uh, let me go to mathematics. So I actually uh, change subject uh, topic a little bit. So what uh, was announced will be hopeful in the end. Uh, and uh, my main goal is to give some kind of update uh, on a topic we discussed with Barry about a quarter century ago. So <coughs> uh, today's look of this is like that. So it's mixed motives uh, and uh, geometry of uh, modular manifolds. And of course, former title was just an example of this relationship. And so let me start from uh, very uh, kind of general uh, remarks. So we're talking about mixed motives. But if you consider uh, pure motives, then uh, Langlands and then Clausel making this precise. So they uh, taught us that pure, let's say, rank M, uh, m pure motives of rank M, uh, let's say, over Q. So they are reflected in the uh, world of uh, modular forms by aftermorphic representations. of GLM over Adels, which are algebraic at infinity. Uh, so mixed motives, so this is pure motives. So mixed motives, they're built uh, from pure motives. They're kind of uh, successive extensions of uh, pure motives. And so it's very natural to wonder uh, how uh, the aftermorphic world uh, reflects uh, this phenomena. So one can, for example, ask a question, can we see something of just all of these mixed motives? Uh, we are uh, modular manifolds, meaning aftermorphic world. And uh, today I want to give some examples and just want to say again that uh, uh, the simplest of these examples is the one we discussed with Barry. And mm, so if you want to look at mixed motives, so first of all, you want to mix the simplest of them, but you want to get a great supply of them. And so like a source of them is a motivic fundamental group. It's a great source uh, for a curve. You don't need to go higher, of course. Uh, this is a great source of mixed motives. And so, mm, what we wanted to do today, we want to look at two examples, two if I have time, but the first, we want to take the fundamental group of multiplicative group minus n's rules of unity, 
this tangential base point at zero. And uh, I'm going to uh, show that this relates in a very strange way to geometry uh, of these modular manifolds. Mm. And this is subgroup gamma 1 and n, which is a matrices which is like that mod n. Uh, mm, and uh, I'm going to talk about this in situation when m is 1, of course, but then 2, 3, and 4. The relation sometimes exists uh, uh, for large m as well, uh, but this is where it's really precise. And what we discussed with Barry in, in his office was the first situation when it's 2. And then the second kind of update is that the story doesn't uh, end here. So basically, what's going on here is when we consider the field Q, but we also can consider some other fields. For example, we can take Q of i. And in this case, this relationship looks as follows. So we would take uh, elliptic curve. Uh, so it's our elliptic curve is CM multiplication. And then consider, again, material fundamental group of this elliptic curve minus P torsion points, or N torsion points, let me take P. Uh, where P is a uh, ideal, prime ideal in the ring which acts by endomorphisms of this elliptic curve. And this similarly, uh, in a very similar fashion, is related to this Bianchi ripples. So who they are, it's a very similar thing. So it's now it's three-dimensional hyperbolic space divided by a very similar subgroup now related to the prime ideal P. And uh, it turns out that this relationship, uh, uh, a piece of it, I can just, uh, I will explain this later on, but this is nothing just but variation on Mazur's modular symbols. Here refer to mm, various mm, uh, modular symbols, which actually there is no paper, so I can understand. They appear in the work of Ash and Rudolf with reference to Berry in Vincenzo in 79. Is this correct? <laughs> <laughs> but at least that's what's written there. Okay, so I'm talking motivically. Uh, yeah. Bianchi, yeah. GLN. Yeah, yeah. I see, I see. <laughs> okay, I'll define them. But so the, the same question. <coughs> On the right hand side, you seem to be a limited to m equal to 2. Is that? Uh, the results are limited for m equals to 2. So you expect the same? Uh, it's a good question. So, I mean, please ask me this question at the end. I mean, I, I cannot explain. Uh, the story before I explained what it's about. So, okay, so I started to talk about motivically, uh, but uh, as we know, motives, they can be seen in realizations like Eladic or Hodge. And I choose a language of Eladic because uh, it's kind of more arithmetic today. And so when we sit at the Eladic side, so the Gallo side, So we see the following, that first of all, uh, we start with motivic fundamental group, but we uh, have its elliptic realization, which is given by the pro L completion of the usual topological fundamental group uh, of punctured C star. And uh, we can linearize the problem. So via multi of completion, uh, we can replace the group, which is a huge pro Eladic group, by a Lie algebra, which is uh, pro nilpotent mm, Lie algebra over QL. And it's free with uh, n plus 1 generators, as it's obvious from the description. Now, what do we see when we look at this object? So, uh, first of all, this Lie algebra, it's a Lie algebra, it carries 
uh, canonical Galois invariant weight filtration. It's called W. And in this particular case, uh, it happened to coincide with lower central series uh, uh, for this uh, Lie algebra. So it's filtered by commutators. Now let's look how it actually looks like on the picture. So we start with uh, the biggest quotient, which is first dimensional homology of Gm minus mu n. I tend to omit the index, uh, the, the upper, upper script L, because eventually the story is elliptic after all. And so this is kind of the whole thing, less than one. Then the next quotient is double commutators, which H, uh, H2 of H1. So this is less than minus two, and so on. Then goes triple commutators and so on so far. And so uh, now what we want to do, uh, so I want to explain how Gala groups enter through this business. So what we do, we restrict, so forget to say that of course the Gala group, the absolute Gala group, X by symmetries of this object, that's the main point. Uh, and we wanted to actually understand how the Galo group acts here. This is the main goal. And we want to understand how it acts here and how it sees these modular manifolds. So uh, we restrict to representation phi n L of the Galo group of Q bar over field is obtained by adding all L roots of unity and n. And so, now it acts, so it maps to automorphisms of this huge elliptic Lie algebra. And so what we wanted to do, we wanted to consider the image and linearize it. This means that we introduce some graded Lie algebra, which depends on n, uh, which is uh, the following thing. So you take image of this uh, uh, Galois group, and uh, you take the Lie algebra of this, and don't stop, so you are consider the associate graded quotient for the weight filtration. This makes this object kind of more uh, canonical. Now, what we get, and what we're after is a Lie algebra, so it's G dot. So it's just direct sum of G minus one plus G minus two plus G minus three and so on. And we wanted to know what the spaces are and how the commutator works. It's a graded Lie algebra. Okay. Uh, now, mm, uh, let me explain in a kind of in slightly different way. So this is just kind of the uh, definition, which is a little bit uh, enigmatic. So what we're actually doing for any integer 0, 1, 2, and so on, uh, we look at a uh, Galois group uh, acting on the following thing. So we take, we have this filtration, so we take some number k and consider uh, quotient of amplitude m. So for each k, which is minus one and so on, and for given n, we consider these quotients uh, of our Lie algebra. And then Galois group acts on this already finite dimension quotients, but there are infinitely many of them for all k. We just kind of take some, some something of amplitude m and then push it to the end and look what we get. And then we see that uh, uh, we get, we get some maximal uh, uh, Galois subgroup, which X trivial is there. So, so therefore, it produced for us some tower of fields. So we have a tower of fields, like uh, we start with Q, then we have the field F1, which is nothing but Q of zeta L infinity N. Then we have the next field F2, and so on. And uh, we can record the Galois group, so this is clear. This one is a new one, so we call it G1. Uh, sorry, it's numbering wrong. It's F1, F0, F1, 
F2 and so on. So this is G, G, G2 and so on. So we get these uh, groups and they are abelian, abelian elliptic groups. So we can consider the Lie algebras. And uh, the point is that, let me write general definitions, that GM is a Galois group of this Fm of F0. And uh, the Galois group of this extension, which is cyclotomic, with a little bit uh, more quotient, acts uh, on this guy. And we wanted to consider the Lie algebra of the definition again of uh, you, you consider the Galois group acting on W minus K divided by days? So I, uh, what I wanted to say is that so far I'm talking about this abelian quotient, like for example, first of them, okay? And so, I, so what I wanted to say is that uh, I wanted to consider this Lie algebra, and this is uh, the same thing which we introduced before. Okay? So what is the definition of the, of, uh, of Fn? Uh, I write it but didn't say. So, so you consider, you consider these quotients. So for example, you consider the, 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 uh, the zero quotient and then you're just talking about a oh, Galois group acting on the homology, elliptic homology. So you get what you get. So uh, then you consider the first quotient. Now you're talking about x ones. So you have your filtration. This is associated graded. And you consider just, uh, just extensions, all possible extensions. And so you ask the question, what kind of, basically, what kind of extensions you get? And so you consider, uh, I mean, you take the image of the Galo group and you basically ask the question, what the image is? That, that's, and so the, the, it's, the F is the, the corresponding field. Uh, <coughs> and so, for example, uh, you can ask the question, what is this uh, G minus one? And the first thing you see is that you better go to the dual because the dual has a very nice description. This is, uh, uh, you know, O star of the, uh, let's call it scheme SP, which is just the spectrum of the cyclotomic field with one P added, uh, tensor uh, QL of one. So that's how uh, the first guy looks like. And so what we learned here is that first of all, we better look to the duals than to the spaces because they have nice description. And so this is just a group of cyclotomic units. So the group of cyclotomic units tells you what this guy is. Okay, so now you can ask the next question. So how about, uh, <coughs> oh, where is this thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can ask the next, the next question. Mm, how about uh, uh, the thing which has uh, depth two from this point of view when m equals two? Mm. And so when m equals two, you're talking about Lie algebra structure on this G minus one, which you already know, and G minus two. It's a graded Lie algebra over QL. And so what we want to know, we want to know the commutator map, which goes from H2 of G minus one to G2, G minus two, because there is no other possible commutators here. And it turns out that as before, it's much better to dualize the picture and look to G minus two dual, uh, dual to commutator map going to wedge square of G minus one dual. So this is the guy which we wanted to see. And we wanted to describe this guy. Okay, I can actually start describing this guy, but <laughs> I want to make story uh, kind of more elementary, at least for exposition. So what I wanted to do now I wanted to go to some quotient, you can call it cyclotomic Lie algebra. And so this guy is G minus one plus G minus two plus and so on. And I want to consider subjective map to something which I'll introduce uh, in a second, C minus one, 
c minus 2, and so on. So this actually will be, uh, it's actually not even isomorphism here. So I'm going to get some quotient Lie algebra in a natural way, and then talk the whole lecture about this. So how you define this quotient? All right, you notice that geometrically gm minus n roots of unity embeds into gm. And therefore, if you, mm, you can consider the corresponding fundamental Lie algebra, Lie group of the fundamental group here, which is just QL of 1, and you can map the fundamental group, uh, better to say the corresponding Lie algebra, uh, to this one, subjective, of course, and then you get the kernel, which is a co-dimension one kernel of this map. Oop, forgot to say kernel. And uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted to consider some depth filtration. Its role will appear later, so far just a definition. So it's by definition just lower central series uh, of this codimension one ideal i. And then I have two filtrations, weight, which is completely canonical and works for uh, any variety. And depth, which is very specific, it just uses this specific case. And so we introduce uh, the following quotient, so it's g minus w minus m. Uh, so I define this as a quotient with respect to depth filtration and with respect to, uh, I can just say what I already introduced, g minus w of mu n. And this is minus m. Once again, so what I'm doing, I'm introducing one more filtration on the topological object, on the fundamental Lie algebra. Then it filters everything, like derivations, the image of the Galois group. It induces some filtration on the image of the Galois group. And I'm cutting out uh, my Lie algebra by introducing the C minus M of mu N to be just diagonal part. This is just G minus M minus M. So here one can easily see that W is always not less than M, but here uh, we just took the diagonal part. And as you will see, this makes just presentation uh, simpler. Okay, so what do we want to do? So we wanted to understand this Lie algebra. And so the same questions about this Lie algebra, how the commutator looks like and how the, uh, actually I just realized that I told you a lie. I beg your pardon. So, I mean, this isomorphism with cyclotomic units is C minus 1. That guy is big. I beg your pardon. This is, ah. The units in bed, but that's, uh, actually, actually, it's okay. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So, everything else in a bigger weight. It's okay. It's correct. Okay, so there's no lie. So I want to understand this Lie algebra, and what does it mean to understand uh, some Lie algebra? So we wanted to consider the cochain complex of this Lie algebra, because in particular it tells us about the commutator. Uh, so we consider the standard cochain complex. So we take, uh, I introduce notation, this curly C W of mu n is going to be dual C do C w and this is supposed to be minus m and this is supposed to be m. It's supposed to be dual uh, vector space. And now this vector space is form of course a Lie co-algebra. So this means that I have, I will omit n's now. I have a co-bracket which is going to wedge square of C dot. And then I can continue the story. I can go to wedge cube in a natural way, wedge 4, and so on. So we got this complex, which in particular contains the information we were looking for, the co-commutator. So if you know this complex, we, of course, know uh, more than we wanted to know. We know the Lie algebra and its cohomology. But this complex is graded <coughs> by this degree m. And so what we can do, we can take the m's part of this complex and consider its cohomology. And so this is a guy which is, hmm, 
denoted cohomology of degree m of the C, uh, C dot. All right, now I can uh, state the theorem. This is the main theorem at this moment, which tells you who this cohomology are, assuming uh, that my level is prime. So let me give you somehow a picture of this cohomology computation. So on one hand side, uh, you wanted to put the cohomology of this Lie algebra, cyclotomic Lie algebra of mu p, level p, of degree m. So m is going to be 1, 2, three and four. And so if you want to consider the corresponding uh, cohomology, we are talking about complex. And this complex is very simple at the beginning. This is just C1 of mu p. And here I'm going to put the answers. And uh, uh, we know who, what it is. It's just O star of this sp. And it's just one vector space. So this is this guy, tensor QL. Then if you go to the level to, uh, 2, you get C2 going to wedge 2 of C1. And the cohomology here turns out to be H1 of gamma 1 to P with the coefficients in determinant representation. Everything tensor QL, I'm not going to keep writing this. And here we get the same thing, but H0. And Barry, this is exactly what we discussed in the office. Yes. Now we want to continue. So we take C3. Then we go to C2 tensor C1. This is just the, uh, the standard complex in degree 3. And uh, we get, so we get here H1 of gamma 1, now 3p and standard coefficients. And then we get. Uh, let me think, actually, I think, yes. Then here we get H2, and here we get H3 of the same group. Now we go to the weight 4. Then we have C4. It goes to weight 2 of C2 plus C3 tensor C1. Then it goes to C2 tensor lambda 2 of C1 and goes to lambda 4 of C1. And here, of course, we get gamma 1, 4p. But the numerology is that we get here h3, h4, h5, and h6. And little caveat, so here we get some quotient, which actually I don't know. I have a conjecture what the subspace is, but I can, yes. Yes, yes, thank you, Maxim. Uh, uh, the alternates, epsilon is determinant. Thank you very much. So <laughs> what you see here is that this is what I promised, that you look, you start with the Galois theory of gm minus mu n, and uh, you write down the complexes, and complexes delivers you, when you look at the different grades, uh, cohomology of these groups. And now you can ask whether it's uh, maybe a coincidence, because if you look at this group, all right, so I claim they're the same, but dimensions of this group can be easily calculated, just some number which depends on p, you can find formula in any textbook, and maybe it's a combinatorial accident and this will be zero. So maybe it's not there. But if you look at the other groups here, if you look at this whole region, then this is precisely the caspedal range. It's quite amazing that, that you, you catch precisely the cuspidal range of these groups here. And for the cuspidal cohomology, we you know, of course, and that's sporadic. 
uh, if m is bigger than 2. So you cannot write any formulas for this for dimension. We know that these vector spaces can be non-zero, but we have no formula, no prediction, nothing. So we cannot say basically anything about uh, the spaces, as far as I know, except running program and tell us computer what the number is. But nevertheless, that's what we get. So now we can say unmistakably that yes, we see this uh, modular manifolds sitting somewhere in the, in the fundamental group. And of course, this was not an accident. Okay, so um, now the next question uh, uh, was behind this. So I said that we have the isomorphism between cohomology of this guy and this group cohomology. But when, we, when one proves this, of course, we get much more. So we get isomorphism of complexes. And so I'm going to tell you that, I mean, we, we are going to see in, in a few minutes that actually not only cohomology, but these complexes are realized inside of the, the symmetric spaces. And <coughs> in order to do this, I need to remind you a little bit of geometry. So how we approach cohomology of discrete groups. So we consider the corresponding symmetric spaces. <coughs> and so let me remind you that we have this symmetric space HM, analog of the upper half plane, which is defined as the quotient of GLM R modulo R star plus OM. And for us, it's going to be the collection of all positive definite uh, quadratic forms uh, on a vector space of dimension M of real numbers divided by the positive uh, real numbers. And uh, it's also important that it sits inside of its natural compactification. Uh, not uh, Borel cell compactification, but just some compactification. And this is just same definition when you consider non-negative uh, quadratic forms. So do the same thing. Now uh, we can introduce the corresponding uh, modular manifolds, officially, so to speak. So Y1M P is going to be the quotient of the symmetric space by gamma 1 mp. And so we're after topology of these guys. Now, how we approach this? So first of all... So when you consider this compactification using a semi-definite form, you also divide by r plus star or r? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And what do you do with the zero? You yes. include it? I mean, I don't... I, 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 I delete zero. I okay. should write it, maybe. Oh, maybe I should write it. Not equal to zero. Okay, yeah. So, <coughs> so uh, but what do you think about this? We take, how do you think about this? We take a lattice, which is a lattice. So you want to say what is GLM Z uh, of rank M in the uh, dual vector space. And then uh, we do the following construction. So if you have any element of this lattice, it produces a quadratic form, phi sub f, uh, which is defined as follows. OK, so we have a functional f sits in Vm star. So we can take this functional and evaluate this on any vector. So we get a linear functional function, and so we take its square. So it's a quadratic form, but it's a very degenerate. It's rank 1 quadratic form. So it lives in the compactification. Now, if you have a basis in this lattice, so if you take a basis, f1 and so on, fm of lm, uh, then uh, we can do the following thing. We can take a convex hull. Let me just do it like that. Uh, convex hull of uh, these uh, degenerate forms. And so this is a very simple thing. It's just a linear combination of those. Just remind you what's a convex hull. Uh, phi i, uh, when i goes from 1 to m. Uh, uh, and uh, we assume that lambda i is non-negative. So that's the definition of the convex hull. OK, so what do we get? Uh, 
So now, uh, if you take this thing and project to the modular manifold. So what we get, I, I want to have some notation for this. Let's denote this like, like that, phi1 star and so on, phi phi m, uh, which belongs to homology. I'll tell you in a second why of gamma 1 mp, borel mul homology. And this is the definition of, these are Mazur's uh, modular symbols. So look at the paper by Ash and Rudolph. And in 79 and so on, you'll find uh, the same definition there. So uh, what Barry noticed, so first of all, uh, you want to see an example first. So the example is when m equals 2, then you have an upper half plane. And so on an upper half plane, you have this famous modular decomposition. And so uh, what you get, uh, you get at this moment, you get these lines. For example, line going from zero to infinity. And so when you project them down, <coughs> let me put it this way. So when you project them down to modular curves, you get some strange objects. So you get triangulated surface, topologically triangulated surface. Because there are cusps at infinity. And so what Barry did, so he generalized this picture for GLM. Now for GLM, you have a similar guys. And uh, a very nice thing about them is that they are cycles. Because uh, like here, the boundary of this guy belongs uh, to the boundary of the space. It's at infinity. Here again, if you take a Barry's triangle, then its sides really belongs to infinity. Because this is linear combination of uh, m minus 1 rank 1 form. It's a rank at most m minus 1 in the space of dimension m. It's on the boundary. This means that we got a cycle. It's a very, very simple observation. It's a crucial. So we got a cycle. We got a homology class. Then they generate the homology group. And so these are uh, modular cycles. OK. Now uh, uh, the next thing to do, we wanted to relate this to the original problem. And so we wanted to use uh, Mazur's modular cycles uh, to relate them to the following thing. So first of all, oh, yeah. There are some lines here. So, so these modular cycles, Mazur's modular cycles, they produce you a way to catch those guys, precisely those guys. So you consider this line. And so you can call it Mazur's line. Because that's exactly where the homology which we constructed leave. And it shows also that if you consider anything to the right, you get 0. Uh, so this is the top dimensional homology you can, can possibly have. And they live here. And of course, what we wanted to do we wanted to relate them to this line directly. And so I would call it Milner line because this reminds very much to me this kind of idea of Milner Cassier in resolution by motivic cohomology. But the cohomology of this line closely related to Milner Cassier. But OK, so you wanted to send that line to this one. So let's do this. And this is just a one word construction after little explanations. So we noticed, and this works for any m. Uh, so we noticed, first of all, very elementary observation that the group GLMZ acts on uh, lattice uh, on the basis of our lattice. And uh, if you mod it down by the subgroup we are after, and take linear combinations of the points in this finite set, then uh, mm, actually, even before I take the, if just when I take the set, I can describe it because this is just 
uh, finite field P to power M minus uh, zero point. It's a very elementary observation. And so now we have the key point So we uh, consider a map uh, as I said this maser goes to Milner. So uh, we consider a map from what? So we take this uh, cycles which we get by which are span of maser's modular cycles. They live in borel mul homology of dimension n minus 1 of this modular manifold. Notice I didn't take the homology group they generate, although they generate homology, I just took cycles, Mazur's model cycles. And I map them directly to wedge M uh, of O star of the uh, cyclotomic, P cyclotomic scheme. And actually, as you will see, I will do a little adjustment. I will add one. Uh, one dimension of subspace later on, which corresponds to gamma, Euler's gamma constant, but so far don't worry about this. So how it works? So first of all, you take any collection of residues mod p, and now you know that it represents some element here. And now when your group GLMZ acts on Mazur's modular cycles, so uh, the guys you get are parameterized by this set, but they satisfy some relations like symmetry relations, and when you put plus minus, they do not change. So there's little relations where you satisfy. But it's basically elements of the set. So we take the corresponding cycle here. This is again, this is Mazur cycle, modular cycle. And we map it to the following unit: 1 minus zeta p to alpha 1, which 1 minus zeta p to alpha 2, which and so on, which 1 minus zeta p to alpha m. Now, if you, I think Offer is going to ask me a question at this moment. <laughs> huh? I, you, you play the role of the Offer. So your question is what you do if alpha is 0. Yeah. Exactly. So you just say that, that we use a symbol, I call it a motivic gamma. This is just some extra element which I just add to the game, which do not talk to anybody else, but it, make, it makes the answer much simpler. I can avoid it, it doing this, but the answer will be very explicit, but a little less nice. Just, just, so it's just doing this for, for, conven for, for convenience, but I believe it actually makes sense. So I believe it's really, you really add to your Tate motives one more. Okay, so we consider this map, this map is Surjective, and so after that you can ask questions: What happens uh, with this map? Is there any kernel of this map? And you can guess that we're going to say that we want to construct a resolution because this Mazur's uh, modular cycles they live on the right, and I wanted to introduce now kind of high analogs of Mazur's modular cycles, and they will provide me a map from that complex to this complex. So now I wanted to do kind of high. What? Uh, so alpha 1, alpha m are in fp to the m minus zero. And what is ch ch ch? Oh, ch is just chains. It's just borel mur chains. So, so um, they're cycles. I just use this notation because my c is overloaded. So this is, a, this is, so you have in this manifold, you have chains of dimension m minus 1. This is Mazur's model uh, cycles. They're actually cycles, but I just said chains at the moment, okay? And they're infinite, so they produce your cycles, but I just use the word chain, okay? But the map is, uh, is defined only on those chains? Or on yes, yes, yeah, only on those chains. So I take these chains, and for each, I basically take the span of Mazur's model cycles. Just take the linear combinations. For example, if you get zero, it's supposed to go to zero, and so on. So, is that okay? Okay, so this is the transform under GLM of the... Okay. This is, yeah, okay. So now I wanted to do the resolution of this. Okay, my blackboards are, the nice ones are limited. So let's go here. Mm. No. Ah. Uh. 
Beautiful. So, what kind of resolution? So remember this modular picture, so I'm going to erase it. But <coughs> what I wanted to do, I wanted to take this uh, group, which uh, generated by Mazur's guys, and I wanted to write a resolution. Um, I skip Borel Moore here, but they all kind of in this setup. And so in the end of the day, I'll go up to uh, uh, chains of degree 2 and minus 2. And this is on this modular manifold y1 of m. So I wanted to build this, so we don't yet have it. So is it a group of chains or modulo or modulo uh, Let's Let's wait till the definition. I think it would be better when this is definition. So far, just some abelian group. And so they are not they are not cycles any longer, so there is a differential inherited by the differential on chains, and we wanted to map this exactly where we wanted to map them. We want to map them to which m of O star of S p. This guy we wanted to map to the next guy, which is C two tensor lambda m minus two of C uh, C m minus two. No, no, C2, M minus 2 of C1, and so on. And the most interesting one, we wanted to map to the CM of my mu p. So why emphasize this? Because we really, after this guy, we really want to know what this guy is. And so what we did so far was, uh, from the point of view of this Galois-Ali algebra, OK, it was, it, it was OK, but we didn't, we, we didn't catch the, the main guy. This is where our interest is. So how we do this? There is a construction. The construction goes as follows, the generalization of uh, major cycles. But it starts to remind, you'll see what. So uh, by the way, so if you do this construction for m equals 2, you'll recover triangles on that picture. So for m equals 2, you have uh, these guys and these guys. This is a complex. Now, key geometric construction. So let's take any basis f1 and so on fm, and let's complement it by one more vector f0, which makes this uh, sum of them equal to 0. And then I wanted to construct some chain which depends on these vectors. And this is going to be, after projection, this is going to be something, I mean, right now it's going to be something which lives in 2m minus 2 chains of this symmetric space. And later on, we will project it down. So we're just doing some kind of generalization of this modular picture. So the construction goes as follows. So we take a circle, and we put this m plus 1 vectors on the circle. Put here f0, f1, f2, f3, and so on, fm. And then we take a plane trivial n3, uh, which is uh, Uh, which labeled by these vectors. So, so what dimension is that? That's that just the graph? Uh, this is just the graph. It's just the graph. So you take a graph and you make this plane trivial and tree, let's call it T. Uh, now, uh, first of all, you notice that if you happen to have an edge of this tree, for example, this one, then what you can do, you can cut this edge. And then you have two trees. So you have this tree and you have the other tree. But uh, each of these trees is labeled by the vector. So what you can do, you can introduce vector. Uh, so you assign to E vector f sub E, which is defined as sum of uh, several of these vectors. So in this case, it will be sum from f1, f2, f3, and up to this point. You can say, OK, why don't you take the other? Uh, three is that your construction is not canonical. The answer is, well, we can take the other one, but since they sum to zero, we get negative of that. So if you take this tree, so here you get f sub e, so you get negative f sub e. So it's almost canonical. So now we can use this as follows. Okay, let me 
Let me come here. So I define uh, the cycle uh, phi of f0 and so on fm to be uh, sum over all plane uh, three valent trees T uh, labeled or decorated by your F0 and so on Fm. So basically you take all pictures which I draw like that, could be different pictures, you consider all of them. And for each of them you do the following thing. So the most important thing you do, you take the convex hull uh, of uh, the following guys. So remember I got vector F sub b, but if I have a vector F sub b, it's giving me quadratic form, f sub e squared, which I denoted by phi sub e. And so I take the convex hull of these many vectors, phi e1 and so on, phi e 2m minus 1. Because there are exactly 2m minus 1 of the edges of this tree, if you label by this basis. And therefore, it produces you a simplex of dimension 2m minus 2, as, as we want it. But that's not the end of the story because we have to take the sum of those guys and we don't label the edges of the tree. So we have to pay little price for this. So we put a sign of E1 and so on of E2m minus 1. And this is a sign which is related uh, to the canonical orientation of the plane. So there is one way to introduce a sign here. I'm not going to talk about this. So that's the main construction. And for example, uh, if you take m equals 2, that you really get these triangles. So then the cycle is, is just one, because you have these three vectors on the circle. Don't mix this circle uh, with that circle. That circle is combinatorial, and this is the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. But then if you consider three major, oh, actually classical model cycles, there is unique uh, 2D cycle here, uh, triangle here, and this triangle is exactly the guy which I assigned to it. If you go, for example, for m equals 3, Geometry gets a little bit more complicated. I just give you a cartoon what you get, but not very complicated. So you basically get a pyramid because there will be, in this case, uh, you can have only two different plane trivalent trees. And so what you get, you get two tetrahedra, but these two tetrahedra are joined in a prism. So this is the cycle which we constructed for m equals 3, and so on, so on. All right, so we constructed a map. Uh, we didn't construct a map. We defined this group so far. Now, before I go <coughs> to the rest, it's very easy to go to the rest of the complex from here, but I wanted to tell you more important things, how we go from here to here. So who goes to whom? Here, I don't have, unfortunately, time to explain the construction. Mm. Mm. I'm just saying uh, that uh, it's kind of, key motivic construction. It turns out that one can define uh, for any, if you have any rules of unity, for example, uh, in mu n, then you can define, actually, if you take any collection of points on GM, you can still define some elements. So I call it motivic correlator of this, in this case, uh, units. And I assume for technical reasons that the product is one to match the construction. And so where this guy lives, it lives precisely in this C minus M of mu P star. Uh, not star, sorry, dualized. So I claim that I can uh, define for you absolutely canonical elements which live in the motivic Lie algebra. They become so canonical because I took at the beginning graded for associate graded for the weight filtration, but they're absolutely canonical elements. There is no Dual Lie algebra, yes. Very important, dual. So uh, all, all kind of work is in the dual. You never work with Lie algebra, you always work with the dual. That's where you see these objects. Okay, so now you have these objects, but you also remember that there's one more game you can play with motives. You can take the Hodge realization. And so what happens? Because I didn't tell you anything about these elements, and actually forgot to tell you the main thing. 
that how this construction works. So, mm, uh, okay, let me do it here. So the main construction takes a cycle phi of alpha zero and so on alpha n. This is a cycle I can define upstairs, the generalization of Mazur's modular symbols. So now it's a cycle of dimension 2 m minus 2, not a cycle, it's chain. It's, it's, it's boundary, not zero. And so we map it just to this motivic correlator of zeta p, you take some root of unity raised to power alpha zero and so on, zeta p raised to power alpha m. And so you land, as I said, in this cm of mu p. And so in the end of the day, that's, that's how you get the map. So this map now construct, constructed modulus effects that I did not explain to you who these guys are. But I'm going to tell you not who they are, but how they look in the Hodge realization. Uh, and, okay, why don't I erase this? <coughs> so notice the following, that I have this uh, Lie uh, Li, uh, co-algebra CM, and I was talking all the time about its elliptic realization. Now we do have mixed motifs, mixed state motifs. We do have motivic fundamental group, for example, defined in our paper with Deligne. And so we can consider now this as a motivic guy. Now we have a new game to play. We can go to the Hodge realization of this Lie algebra, and then there is a canonical period map, which is not at all obvious, uh, but it's constructed in my paper on Hodge correlators, some cano absolute canonical map from here to real numbers. So in the end of the day, uh, if you start with this guy, which lives here or here, then you get a number. And so you can ask the question what this number is. Actually, this motivic correlators, uh, if you understand a little bit this motivic uh, philosophy, then all you need to know, you need to know co-product in this Lie algebra, and I can tell you it explicitly, maybe in a second, and you need to know the Hodge realization of this guy. Then it's uniquely determined over number fields. So all I need to tell you, I need to tell you what is this uh, Hodge correlator. And it's given by construction, which is very similar uh, to this one. That's why I wanted to present it. So what you do, you again take a circle, but now you label the circle not by vectors, but by your roots of unity. You can take any actual points on GM. Just for convenience, I take roots of unity. And then uh, consider the same plane trivial and tree. So in this case, like that. It's exactly the same combinatorial setup. But now uh, they are decorated. So they are decorated by those points outside and by some points inside, like y1, y2, y3. So before we took the edge, an edge, E, and we assign to this H something, which was used as a building block. Now we do the same, but the something is going to be a logarithm of absolute value, in this case y1 minus y2, and in general this is just a green function of these points y1, y2. This answer we get because we normalized appropriately using the tangential base vector. So we just assign this guy, I just call G y1, y2 for short, and then uh, we do the following construction. So uh, we consider uh, this green function assigned to the edges g e one e one which d c of g e two which and so on which d c of g e two m minus one. So notice that this is form of dimension two m minus two, and then uh, we integrate this over uh, our c p one uh, to all internal vertices this y's, and then we take the sum of all plane trivial entries as before. So this is kind of identical combinatorially to this construction. You also put a sign, of course. So it's kind of identical, but we put green functions instead of putting here this degenerate uh, quadratic forms. So you get a number, and so there is a theorem that this number, this is the canonical period of uh, the Hodge realization. So this means that we de uh, this determines uh, uniquely who this guy is. And okay, I actually don't have. Maybe I have. I mean, 
couple of minutes because we start a little later, but I unfortunately don't have time to tell you how it defines the intermediate steps. It's very easy and kind of mimic the construction of this cochain complex. I defined you C4 and you know C1 and the rest is kind of wedge products. Here I defined you this Cho and uh, the other Cho are wedge products of them in some, in some sense. So I, it's very easy, but I skip this. But uh, other than doing this, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit more on what happens next. So now we come to the story about Bianchi Strifles finally. So, okay, let me do it. Just take a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes. Uh, what to sacrifice? So as I said, the story before was concerning GM minus mu n, and we played basically with roots of unity. And this is kind of high cyclotomy game because we started with cyclotomic units. They describe the simplest uh, piece of the Galois group, and then we went up and got uh, the rest of the cyclotomic Lie algebra. Now we want to go to elliptic curves, and here's what we get. So first of all, the game with motivic correlators can be played on a universal elliptic curve. So take universal elliptic curve. Then uh, we get here something which I called Euler complex. Uh, just the same game, so we get some complex C2 of elliptic curve and n torsion points going to wedge 2 of C1 of elliptic curve n. So this is the same game with motivic correlator. So this is motivic kind of motivic guy. And this motivic guy related to pi 1 of universal elliptic curve minus n torsion points in a way which can be specified very, speci uh, very uh, precisely. So we start here. Now we can go three different roads. So you can go to the cusp, uh, which is our cusp SP, and then we get today's story for m equal 2. It turns out that this complex specializes exactly to the complex which describes uh, this first non-trivial quotient of cyclotomic Lie algebra. So it is an explanation, I'm talking to Barry, so in your office, we was talking about this. This is an explanation where the modular curve come from, from here. This is really modular curve, so geometry is there. It's Secondly, why it's called Euler? Why I call it Euler? So I define this guy, but you can go here to, uh, uh, this guy produce you two Ziegler units. You can take their class in K2, and this is precisely balanson cut euler system. So that's why the name. So this lives in K2, and this lives at the generic point. But you can also go to cyclotomic point, to, to CM point, like the one I choose today. And then you get a new complex, which relates to, uh, to Gaussian integers. And the answer is that for this complex, for this specific complex, so you can call it something like C2 of some prime ideal. It's the same notation, kind of H2 of C1. So it relates to Bianchi manifolds, and let me, this is the last thing I'm telling you. So what Bianchi manifolds do, they first of all, you start with the n log of the modular decomposition. So you take a rectangle with vertices at 0, i, 1, and 1 plus i, and do it like that. Now if you put this on a hyperbolic space, you get a picture like that, and you kind of make it grow to infinity. And then you also add this guy, so you get some kind of thing which is octahedron. And this octahedron, they're analogs of my uh, triangles. And now the game goes as follows. This, when you project down to the modular manifold, this guy goes here, this triangle goes here. The cohomology uh, turns out to be given by H1 uh, of gamma 1, 2p, and H2 gamma 1, 2p. Uh, I want to notice here is some portion which I don't completely control, but here it's an isomorphism. I note that that's exactly the range where the cuspidal cohomology are, so you again get cuspidal cohomology in the end, starting from the Galois theory. And even more interestingly, you see that you get these octahedrons, and it had some cycles here. Uh, I start to rush. So it's, this is one and two, it's homology. So, uh, so there are some 
homology class here, which is sporadic, cuspal homology classes. They tell you that the elements, the motivic correlators which you see here, satisfy some relations which we do not expect at all. And we don't know how to describe them except going through this picture. So we know that they exist, but that's it. So that's the end of the story. So oh, the, the, the very last thing that I have a student, uh, Kulia Malkin, Uh, who in his thesis explains how the story goes uh, when you go to the whole Galilee algebra, don't cut it as we did. And we get here cohomology of these guys with coefficients and symmetric uh, powers of the two-dimensional representations, the same story. Okay, sorry. Is there questions? Yeah. Yeah. Remark. Actually, I, I remember in the early 90s, uh, sort of about graph cohomology, yeah. there was a, a, a thing which never developed. It was very, very similar. I think it's all, almost the same. You consider not punctured curve, but closed curve, and consider derivation of the pretty important completion of Lie algebra. Sure. Sure. You, you get, uh, the cohomology of this Lie algebra are the same as cohomology of uh, all the kind of graph complex, for, which is responsible for auto automatism of free group. It was kind of Lee, Lee version of graph complex. Yeah, and this is very similar to things with punctures, which is kind of very close relative, and complex have length growing linearly in yes, dimension, not only quadratically like the Yes, yes. So yes, I yes, think yes. it's really about graph complexes. Yes, yes, I think so. I didn't tell you how to define motivic correlators, and I do use uh, your work. Yeah. So, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, the cycles, there's, uh, the chains that. Um, that generalize modular symbols. They're not cycles. No. And their boundary, what, what can you say about their boundaries? What can you say about Thank you. You give me a chance to tell you the answer. <laughs> 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 but it's quick. OK, maybe uh, so you see better. And I have a follow-up question, which is, uh, is there a similar structure for Heka? Operators than they would be on the modular symbols? Uh, that's a good question. So I don't know a good answer to this question. So if you go to the cohomology, sure, the Hecker creator section. Yeah. So on the level of complexes. Yeah. Uh, but look, the answer is the following. So you start with this uh, guy, which basically a circle with collection of vectors f0, f1, f2, f3, f4, f5, and so on. And what you do, you cut it. So you take one of the vectors you like, for example, this one, and you take the arc here. You cut it. So after you cut it, you see that you have two semicircles. But uh, when you cut it, you inherit it, like here, you inherited three vectors. So you put them here, but they're supposed to sum to 0. So you put the fourth vector here. So you get one, two, three, four vectors, but you get one more. That's the answer. So you have to take sum of all possible cuts. So the answer is very, very simple. And of course, the theorem is that motivic correlators co multiply in the motivic algebra exactly the same way. That's why it's a map of complexes. And you also see why it's easy to define kind of all cycles in between. You kind of take which product, in this case, the convex hull of the construction you already know. For example, your construction, uh, the simplex is just convex hull of these three guys. That's why we have the wedge product, wedge m. That's it. It's very simple. So first of all, a remark. Uh, in your picture here, the, the H6 is still uh, in the Caspidal range in the bottom line, right? Uh, I think H4 and N5 in Caspidal range. Sorry? I think H4 and N5, if my memory is correct. Is it 5, the middle degree? <laughs> the middle degree is 4.5, so it's oh, 9 okay. divided by 2. So it's uh, as a segment, which is, again, it's, it's 1 for SL2, 2 for SL3, oh, okay. 2 for SL4, and the center is middle, 4.5. Uh, but, uh, okay, the, the next question is, uh, two years ago we were listening uh, to yes. Katesh. So, uh, do, do you underst understand the plausible relation with... Uh, no. Uh, first of all, uh, I wish I... Uh, so, uh, uh, this story is, is, the beginning is very old of the story, so it's like quarter century old. And at that time I, I, I saw about this... Uh, you know, numbers like 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and so on. And notice that they correspond to x1, but I have no idea. x1, hoch x1, I thought. I have no idea why, why it appears. It's interpretation of uh, 
Zuckerman and Wogan. And so what Venkatesh does, he explains, he gives a huge evidence that actually, indeed, this is not a coincidence. So, so this kind of Caspital Ranch is, ca is related to X1 of material cohomology, and I have no idea why. So in particular, you don't get the whole range of the... I get what I get, up to four. It's a, it's a difficult theorem to prove uh, on the level four. So like before I did this, when I discussed with Vary, I did the case M equals two, then in couple of years N equals three, and then in a number of years N equals two, it, it's already like 20 pages. And I don't claim anything uh, about higher M. Okay. And uh, my last question is, at the beginning, uh, when we are starting from the, the realization of the uh, Galois group, mm -hmm. uh, it was Eladic, clearly. Yeah. And then uh, it seems that after a while we are... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After a while we, we, there was a diffusion to the motivic world through the wall, yes. yes. And we end the motivic. Yes. Does that mean that there is a Q structure when you... Oh, of course, of course, of course. It's, the, the whole story is motivic. I started Eladic just because for perception it's kind of easier. Because when you start talking about motivic Gallo groups, you lost your audience. So uh, that's why. But this, the story is 100% uh, motivic and it's very important.